Good morning, everybody. Before anybody ask, yes, I am standing up. I hope you can see me. I know you can hear me. I hope you can see me. Uh, I just always complain about getting stuck with the last presentation on the last day. I gotta say, the first presentation on a Sunday morning probably sucks a little bit worse than that. Um, raise your hand if you're actually in the Zoe or Python or Plum community. Okay, so we have a few of us here. Uh, any of you who are in the community and know me know that it's ludicrously funny for me to be giving a developer talk. I'm in marketing uh, But I have a trick for everybody today, and you'll love my trick for how I pull this off. Um, as an introduction, uh, I'm Paul Everett from Zia Partners. We are a nonprofit business partner network of the people who build Zoke and Clone. Really interesting concept, uh, organized primarily in Europe. Uh, we're headquartered. Gautua is, well, how do you say the word for people from Brussels? Do you say Bruxelles? Bruxelles. Bruxelles. That's a good name for a project. Uh, so, any of you from Brussels, Zia Partners is headquartered in Louvain la Neuve, and Gautua is from that city as well. Xavier uh, Hayden, as you might see him today, is the head of Zia Partners. Uh, I'm also the president of the Plum Foundation and former uh, co-founder of Zoe Corporation. So although I may not write a lot of code, I get to hang around with people who do. Um, just as a little bit of background, how many of you, raise your hand, raise your hand if you're awake. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't your question. Uh, next time, don't give these speakers water, give them coffee because if the speaker falls asleep during his own presentation, it's a bad sign. Uh, how many of you actually do anything with web development? All right, cool. There was a hand back there. That hey, JavaScript counts as web development. I hope it does. Uh, raise your hand if you do PHP. All right, pretty cool. Raise your hand if you do Java. All right, I was, I had a joke ready for that, but too many of you raised your hand. Raise your hand if you think you need a content management system. Hey, now we're getting right to the chase. Of course, all of the people who were in the business of selling such a thing to you just took pictures and wrote down all of your names. You're going to get bugged later about that. Okay, so for 40 years I lived in France, just moved back, and in all those years I never got a chance to come to Fonstein. I moved back to the U.S. in August, and here I am. What's the sense of that? I'd like to note that uh, this is a picture of my wife after the World Cup victory. <laughs> With this presentation, uh, you can just chill out. I know I am, because I did no work for this presentation. I have screencasts for everything. It's all available off of that URL. Or at least or it, it, it will be later on. Um, the hotel had it. It's really fun to wake up the morning of your presentation and put the last finishing touches, you know, the 99% that you write the day of the presentation. And the old launch web service inside your hotel takes your credit card transaction. It's, it completed that part, but the part where it actually assigns you an IP address failed on that. So the slides aren't in the material part actually updated yet, but they will be. In summary, uh, Plone 2.5 is the release version right now. Plone 3 is being worked on. Has a lot of really good and useful user features for content management systems like uh, versioning. Also has some exciting development stuff too. Most of what I'm going to talk about today is the development part. At the end, I'm going to do something really stupid and use the trunk to give uh, a few demos of some user features. The things we're going to talk about are a little bit about the new ways in the world of Plone and to a degree the worlds of Zope and Python for how you get a developer sandbox installed, how you do your work and share it with other people. We're going to talk about Gautois' project for doing Ajax um, and why I say useful. Also a little bit about portlets to show some of the stuff in our stack that's coming up and then finally a tour through some features. 
So what's going on with Clone 3? Uh, major new release. Um, this is a screenshot of the page for the release. Oh, I didn't get mine. Okay, cool. Uh, that manages the roadmap. These are the crack smoking attempts at predicting the future. Um, and these are the clips that go, what's called a clip of clone improvement proposal, where you write down what you plan to do to get somebody to agree with it to schedule for release. Uh, pretty interesting approach to managing work. Lots of new stuff coming in clone free. Let's go ahead and get started and jump right into it. Uh, we'll show a demo about getting a sandbox installed and then I, I, when I, whenever I give a presentation, I pretend that I was listening to the presentation. What would I like to hear as a presentation? I know what you'd really like is a bunch of slides with 18 bullets in a four-point font and the presenter reading them to you as if he was standing in a university lecture hall with whiteboards. But you don't want that, I don't want that, so I'm going to show things to you first and then explain it to you later. So the first demo, these are the people involved in the work on getting uh, this part of the presentation working for getting a sandbox built. That's not California, that's, what, there, there's this big thing on top of the United States, what's that thing called? Canada, yeah. <laughs> I, I like to make fun about the fact that Americans don't really know. <laughs> Funny enough, we just passed the tipping point of absurdity. 50% of kids in the United States can't find the United States on a globe. Okay, so we're in the great, great world of 2007, which is 10 years after the Zope application server started coming out. And things are starting to change in our stack. At the Python level, Python is starting to get a system for packaging things up and distributing them to other people and declaring dependencies. These are called eggs. And has a system for getting these eggs and installing them that is somewhat deceptively called easy install. Um, and then Interesting things also going on in the Python world about how web applications can work together. The nice thing about Python is it's so easy to write a web application, which is also the worst thing about Python, is that everybody does write a web application. So in an attempt to try and share some of this stuff, there is a web services gateway interface, WSGI, and this is an attempt to let Python stuff work in the things I sound like I'm in a spinal tap. Uh, on top of these advances in Python, there are attempts to try and manage the entire process of getting every bit that you might need, including your own bits, configuration information, etc., wrapping them up into recipes that you can send to other people. This is built out and working. And then finally, an attempt to change. Does anybody use uh, Rails? Okay, cool. So, Rails brought out this idea that you can press a couple of buttons and your entire project will be written for you. And then you can just happily work on invoicing the client, uh, scaffolding. And so uh, Python systems are trying to work on that kind of scaffolding, primarily with something called a system, a system called Pace. Which is really nice because you can, instead of telling people the 15 things they need to do, you can create one of these, install it as an egg, and then someone can run a simple command and have a setup built uh, for them ready to go, including uh, passwords and stuff like that. And benefits of these are pretty obvious. I'm dumb. Um, every time I try to do something, I wind up bugging them, but bugging one of the core developers. So instead of me bugging them, they just give me one of these scaffolding things. I run it. I get a shiny pony. I look forward to them. I can play with my pony and not bug them anymore. <laughs> And so scaffolding is written for people like me. The other benefits are we get to leverage some of the work, be a little bit more Pythonic, leverage some of the advances of Python. And the really cool thing is it's great for hard drive manufacturers because every time when you can run one of these things, you get the universe installed in a new directory on your system. 200 megabytes <coughs> for free. Think of all the value. Okay, so let me go over and do uh, my demo for this one. I, 
try to embed this into my presentation, but uh, Keynote loves QuickTime. Doesn't love Flash. So that'll catch up in just a second. 
So with all of this work, what's happening is more and more people start to adopt these advances in Python and these advances in these web systems to be able to go and get packages, install them really easily, create packages, share them with other people, track your dependencies, create built-in configurations. Any of you that might do customer work, this is just awesome because the days where you have to log into their system and do 20 or 30 things in order to get them started, uh, you can just send them a recipe. Hopefully you can still build them for those 30 hours, but it'll only take them two to do it. Okay, so that's the first part of the presentation on packaging. On to some uh, more exciting stuff in the Plum 3 release. Ajax uh, is appearing in lots of web systems these days, and in the beginning I described it as useful and simple, because the work that Godfrey and others are doing in Plum is to go after some specific usability issues to reduce trips to the server, to have boxes that reflect changes with each other, and to also make it simple so that uh, the kinds of people who create valuable things in Plone today can create valuable things that include Ajax. The KSS approach is to be declared, which I really like. Uh, they use something that looks exactly like a CSS style sheet. It's sent to the browser. The browser then interprets that and sets up your various uh, Ajax behaviors for you. It means you have a very limited, well-described universe of things that you can do. Those are client actions, then they talk to things on the server called server actions. The server has a really interesting approach where it will bundle up a unit of work, send it back for execution on the client. That's what we'll see in the demo. Oh, look. I got to go put the flip for that. Do you know the flip number? Okay, so on to the demo for this. So this is the part, in my opinion at least, of KSS 
it is a, it looks like CSS, it feels a lot like CSS. We're doing a CSS identifier to say this DOM node, the archetypes field name description, is going to have what feels like a CSS selector, but in this case, instead of hover or something like that, it's the click event. And then it's going to have this configuration information associated with it. Uh, this stuff in the middle here is obviously unique to KSS. It would be considered an invalid normal CSS style sheet. Once we have the style sheet included, we go back over to the thing you just saw, the CSS registry, and tell Plone, okay, I've got a new style sheet for you. You need to include it in all the pages. Uh, but in this case, the style sheet's a little bit special. It's not a normal CSS style sheet. It is of this type. Here we're linking to the file name over in the uh, Zope system that we just created. We put the kind of relationship we want. And since we're in debug mode, we want to turn off some of this other performance-oriented stuff. Once that's done and we add this directive to Zope CSS registry, by the way, I'm talking in the background on all of the screencast stuff, so you can listen to me explain all this stuff. And we reload the page, then I can go and click on the description and see my first, the first thing I do for debugging is go make sure that the stuff I configured works. I go look for the style sheet, and yes, there's the style sheet. It is linked in like we just told the CSS registry to do. I want to go check Firebug, see if I totally dorked it up. No, I didn't. It was able to find that style sheet. It was able to parse it. And it actually interpreted those rules. If I put a bogus rule in there, it would have told me, I don't know what you're doing. Close Firebug, and now, oh, I wonder if this will work. I wonder if this will work. Oh, this is what's great about screencasting presentation. When I did that, when I actually recorded that, the first five times I clicked that, it didn't work. Just went in the screencast, deleted that part. Error fixed. Debugging through screencast. All my presentations go perfectly in the screencast. Okay, so that's pretty silly, you know. We're just putting up a static message. Let's do something a little bit more interesting. Let's put a custom alert message. So the idea here is that on each one of these directives in KSS that match up to something in the client side DOM. I'm putting some instructions for what's supposed to happen. I just added another instruction. And there's lots of things we can do. Now that's, that's kind of the, the, the easy side from a developer's perspective. This is all that silly CSS JavaScript crap. What happens on the server? Because we want these boxes to interact with the server, send in information, get information, update things in the browser. That's the next Demo. Okay, so this is where we talk about the connection between that client side stuff you just saw and the server side stuff. In this case, we want clicking on the description to send a message to the server. It does some work and send a result back. This is my sandbox setup, uh, the entire phone site. And Godfoy told me the easiest way to cheat on this is to go hijack his module instead of creating a brand new product and registering it and all of that. So I'm going to go down into the, CS, the KSS package, find a little configuration point, hijack it, and wire all my stuff up. In this case, the configuration point that I'm hijacking is the configuration language for Zoe called ZCML, the configuration <laughs> markup language. Uh, this is what one of those files looks like. And I'm going to add in some directives. What this directive is doing is adding, a, essentially adding a new URL to uh, <coughs> to uh, the Zope, the URL is going to be registered for instances of that content type. I say content type, but I won't explain the difference. Uh, this is the name of the URL, and that's the code that it's going to run. Uh -huh. 
Since it points to a Python module, we'll open up Python module and paste some stuff into it that Godfrey told me to paste and not understand what I was doing. Ooh. I'm getting confused between my screens that's running on this side. Okay, so over to the Python module. A uh, pretty small amount of code for the amount of stuff that it's doing. Uh, we get a, a subclass from the hard work that Godfly has done for us. A view that handles the client-server interaction. This is the thing that handles the URL. It's passed an argument. It does a little bit of work. And then, insert magic here. It packages up a, it's almost like X. It sends a set of instructions back to the X server and tells it to do some stuff in the browser. Okay, so once we get that code done, we restart the server and we go check to see if it works. We're going to go and put a new URL on the URL bar to see if we get a response. And we did. You see response one up there. You see the argument I passed to that Python method and the value for that argument calculates the time on the server and sends the string back that you, uh, here's the string that we're passing on that URL. And that's where everything matches on this side. That's in the URL. That's in the query string. The value as the argument on the query string gets put in there. Now we know that the client side works. We know the server side works. Let's wire the two up together. And the wiring happens in that CSS language. So let's go back to that CSS file. Remember, we were altering that CSS file through the web browser. We're going to go open that thing up again. And we're going to put these extra directives that say when I click on this node, go and run this action on the server, send it this argument, get its results back and do something. And it took longer to explain that than time it. Not a very large amount of code for that. <coughs>
what we want to show in uh, in the well, actually, I'll just give you the demo first.
generic setup is a way to do a whole bunch of configuration, press a button, get everything about your configuration saved to a file for checking in the subversion. Uh, running a little low on uh, time as far as demos, so I will <coughs> I'll go a little bit quick on this. I'll probably won't do the whole part. So this is actually running clone uh, locally. And for example, This is going to edit one of the pages. I'm running in deep mode, it's a little bit slow. Um, on the, th this is KSS acting right there. So for example, this is the inline editing of KSS. I'm going to change that to say well. And the page changes somewhat in line, but also the recent changes box was also told to change itself because something happened uh, without really changing the, the entire page, the entire URL. Uh, other things that are available in Clone 3, this is by far the big one. I'll just show it real quick instead of the whole thing. I can make a bunch of changes and then When I save it, I have an option to do version control. Yay. Which is a very important feature for high-end content management systems to give end users the ability to do versioning. And so you see all the versions that I have. I can do diff, revert, add a new version with a comment message through here. This is also configurable, so you can do, for example, auto-versioning. Uh, there's also a system called staging, which allows the public to see one site, uh, one version of all the content while your content producers are working on the journal. Uh, other things that we can do, Plum3 has a system for link checking and validation. If I make a link from one page to another, if I go try and delete the target of the link, I will get a warning that it's linked to from other pages and the confirmation that I actually want to delete it. If I move things from a uh, uh, page from one place to another, if I go to the old URL, I'll be redirected to the new URL. Um, wiki functionality where I can put double friends around phrases and just in the middle of a page, not a special content type. So what's really nice about this is I could have a purchase order content type that I wrote myself, put a rich text field in the middle of it, and it will get wiki functionality. Uh, just because this wiki, wiki, the wiki system is available for anything that has a rich text field in it. Also, indexing of office content uh, using the WBWare libraries. Several other features. So that's a little bit of a talk about Clone 3. I guess I have about five minutes left. Until 11. Oh, the schedule said 1045. Okay. Well, we're going to be uh, having a long coffee break then. <laughs> sorry, the thing I printed earlier had it stopped. Sorry. So, this is a little bit of a run through for developers for, for Clone 3.0, a little bit of the user features as well. What's coming beyond? Uh, Clone 3, the next release, Clone 3.5, is slated for work uh, a little bit later this year. A lot more architectural stuff will happen on it. Same thing as the release page I showed you before. There are these plips that are being written and scheduled for that release. Uh, performance, for example, is, uh, is important for Clone 3.5. Actually, some good things happening in Clone 3. Right now. There are also some things happening that I was involved in yesterday that are happening in our community, hopefully with other communities, that go a little bit beyond code uh, for Plum 3, for future things happening with Plum. Uh, some of us are starting to get involved with some EU activities uh, based around false software, having to do with quality measurements, other kinds of metrics. 
and how this can establish a sense of maturity about open source for governments to make evaluations, but also commerce in Europe to make evaluations. The projects that were presented yesterday that we're involved with a little bit, they're all about collecting metrics, collecting information, doing really rigorous analysis of that, finding out what are the trends, how can we, how can we establish the difference between a quality project and a high quality and a low quality project. What are some of the case studies? And all of this is, I view all of this as important and things that we should talk about within our communities because we want to succeed beyond each other. We all know that it's good. How do we convince other people that it's good? Unfortunately, component architectures are not the best way to convince a decision maker to adopt your software. There is, unbelievably, some skepticism out there about how we do what we do. And it just takes a while. It takes things that we don't know how to do very well in order for us to mature beyond our natural allies. How do we reach some of these skeptics? And the way I look at it is we, involved in these projects, we need to make a decision to engage some of these activities and participate in it because it's good for us. We alone will never be able to reach these people and convince them. They hate revolution. Uh, they like safe, measured approaches. Some of these projects are doing the work for us. They want to help us. They, are come, they want to come to us and say, let us do it for you. You don't have to do anything. All you have to do is let us help you. So if you get a chance to work with some of these projects and talk with them, go to presentations later, please do because uh, I think it's, it's the kind of thing that this course isn't always good at, strategic kinds of things. How do we see the big picture? How do we do things that make an impact farther out? These are the people that are doing it for us, particularly in the EU, it's important. Uh, if we help them get involved inside of our projects, they will do the work to help us explain outside of the false world. So, the, on to the best word for any presentation. In conclusion, uh, that will be the URL for all this material. Clone 3 is coming. Uh, Clone 3 is available now, should be in beta within the next couple of weeks, should be released sometime in May. You'll note that I didn't say of what year. Uh, and Plone continues with Plone 3, the world of Plone continues to grow up. From a feature perspective, it's growing up with things like versioning and staging, which uh, are usually part of the high-end domain of content management systems. It's growing up in terms of how it views itself in the larger world of its stack with the Zope application server and the Python programming language. Uh, we're trying to do work at the right level of the stack, getting involved with X, getting involved with Zope 3. Uh, trying to grow up a little bit on the legal front. Uh, Plum Foundation is really interesting uh, as the, we, we try to manage the group rights for everyone in Plum, protect and promote Plum. So we have around 92 members, uh, board of directors in existence for four years, have about 35 grand in the bank. Um, and we own the copyright for Plum. We can speak on behalf of Plum. Uh, and that is, unfortunately, in the content management world, there are so many content management products. I swear to God, during my presentation, somebody wrote a content management system and published it. Uh, and it might be good, but I doubt the world needs the 12,001st content management system. So as some of the content management systems get bigger, Drupal is after me, uh, some of the ones at the top, you start to see us investigate things more, less about code, more about maturity, more about legal stuff. The people involved with uh, Drupal and Joomla and some of the other systems, we all work with each other about sharing information on how to run foundations, for example. And I view that part as just as important as code. Because we want what, what we do is so good, we've got to share it with other people. And those people care about things like that. And finally, the Plum community continues to grow. 
I got invited to speak in Japan next month. So the more it grows, the more places I get to go. Uh, so if you're interested in content management, if you're interested in uh, big communities, lots of fun, a project with a logo that has its own color, Norwegian blue, and a logo that looks like a Scandinavian light socket, and good content management, then take a look at Plum. Uh, ask me any questions afterwards if you have them. Uh, any questions now before we wrap up? No? If you see me in a bar later on, remember the first speaker of the day gets free beer for the rest of the conference.